and welcome back um, to uh, OASPA um, and to this session, which is entitled Changing Perspective on Knowledge from Marketable Asset to Common Good. Um, I'd especially like to welcome um, uh, everyone uh, who's outside uh, the UK, where I'm based. I think actually it's a time where most countries uh, can um, access access it apart from perhaps uh, Australia, it's a bad time for them, but uh, the representation here is amazing. Um, I'm stepping in, I've, I've, I've stepped in as chair at, at, at short notice, and I would like to thank Ariana Becquerel Garcia, uh, the executive director of Redelic, who helped organize um, this session, who unfortunately is unable um, to be here today. We have um, a couple of great panelists, I'll introduce uh, them in a moment, um, and it, we have we have quite a long session for uh, uh, discussion. And what I'm hoping that we can do today is to really capitalize on the amazing engagement that we've seen throughout the conference from um, the audience um, and get you more involved in the questions and the discussions. And if possible, um, uh, if people would like to come up and uh, show the, share their video. Uh, and discuss things, uh, that would be great. I also think that this uh, session is incredibly well placed in the conference uh, between uh, one about research assessment and whether open science has failed in that, and the, the one after this, which I hope you can all stay on for, um, about values and principles. And what we're discussing in this session is really uh, tied to, to both of those things. Um, some of the themes that I'm hoping we're going to discuss um, today is, is what the role of scholarly publishing is today, um, its link or, or disconnect from scholarly communication, um, the role of commercialization in research. Is it the only problem? And is there a role for any commercial uh, company? The link and entanglement with the prestige economy, which has come up time and again, the role of the global north in creating this system and the inequity it has. Um, we want to touch on research integrity and ethics and values and principles for publishers as well as others and um, governance issues around that. And then also thinking about how we can transition uh, to the future. Um, there's a huge amount um, to, discuss, um, to discuss here. I want to also admit my own uh, uh, background and potentially conflict of interest in this discussion. So I work for a commercial, uh, fully open, well, uh, commercial open access uh, publisher called Hindawi. Um, before that, I worked for PLOS for 14 years, joining them in 2003, um, and they were a not-for-profit. Before that, I worked for Elsevier, um, who's a commercial company. Hindawi itself, a fully open access publisher, got bought out by Wiley um, at the end of 2020, beginning of 2021. Um, and so my own uh, interest in the role of commercial uh, players in this system and whether they can be good actors um, is incredibly uh, close to my heart. And uh, throughout my career, I've been committed to open access and open science. But that's enough about me. I want to introduce our two uh, great speakers um, at the moment. Um, and so first up, we're going to hear from uh, Jean-Claude uh, Guedin, and he um, launched uh, the first electronic scholarly journal in Canada um, uh, back in 1991. And way back in 1991, he was also thinking about open access uh, long before the uh, Budapest Open Access uh, Initiative. And he's been involved in open access and open science. Um, and I'm going to read from his biography here, which is, have led him to conclude that on the whole, commercial scholarly publishing does more harm than good. And he's also come to the conclusion that open science and open access are actually derivatives of the digital world. And I hope he's going to explore most of uh, many of those issues. I also want to flag an amazing article that he wrote a while back now, I think 2014, 2015, called Open Access Towards the Internet of the mind, which is both a beautiful article and incredibly inspiring and um, um, sets that up. 
following on from that, I'm just going to introduce Jennifer Lynn uh, um, um, just now at the same time. I've put the link to the Internet of Mind in the chat. Um, Jennifer um, has uh, more than 20 years of experience in product development, open infrastructure, community outreach uh, and change management. Um, she's um, previously worked uh, with um, industry and with publishers. Um, and uh, we worked together at PLOS um, and before she moved on to Crossrare um, and then the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. And she's now uh, the product director with Indeed uh, USA and has been a deeply committed uh, uh, member of the open access, open science and open infrastructure community. And we're going to hear in particular uh, about POSI, which uh, I shall tell you about, but this really raises issues of governance. But first, um, and we're going to hear from them for about 15 minutes each. I've got some uh, formal questions for them, um, but uh, put in the chat, put in the discussions. Um, because of my role as the chair, uh, um, I should be neutral, but Claire has given me a blessing that I can engage in the discussion here as well as, as a sort of uh, commercial uh, side of, of the discussion. Um, and I look forward to doing that, but hope that Claire will step in if I drift uh, too much in the wrong direction. Right, Jean Claude, over to you, please. We can't see or hear you yet. Oh, I think we've lost him. Ruby, can I just get you to come in and help out? I think if you move on to the next speaker just now, I think he's having technical difficulties. Okay, that's great. Jennifer, can you go up, up front? Absolutely. Great. Let me... I'll stop my video. Get my setting up. Uh, my screen now. Thank you for your patience. Good morning, everyone. I'm um, currently in San Francisco and, and so grateful for this opportunity to talk about POSI. And I will get this set up. All right. Thank you so much for the intros, Katrina. Um, and thank you also for um, the original organizers of this particular session, as well as OASPA. Um, I have very much missed attending OASPA meetings, but um, there is such a strong commitment to uh, the, the continuing to um, bring the community together. And now that we can do this um, remotely, um, all, all the more so. So yes, I um, am going to talk, Jean-Claude is gonna speak on the common good in general and the need for changes in the current system. And I am going to talk about from the practical angle a framework um, wherein organizations who are committed to um, the same, this common good, how they can take practical steps that align their interests um, with the community. So apologies for the little um, switch, um, but we'll, we'll get a, a taste for the practical and then hopefully we will swiftly move over um, to the theoretical, which is really important in order to ground what we're doing and how we approach um, these larger problems. So what is POSI? Um, it is in fact a flower, but here in this context, um, I will start off by saying that it is a community resource. The principles of open scholarly infrastructure offers a set of guidelines by which um, organizations who run um, open scholarly infrastructure and initiatives that, um, that support the research community can be run and sustained. It began as a project with myself, Cameron Nalen, and Jeffrey Builder in 2015 under, I guess it was the Brighton sky, it might've been a sunstroke, um, but it has now evolved into a posse of organizations that have adopted these principles and hooked into a larger cultural discussion about infrastructure funding, partnership building, 
the feasibility of open science practices in today's world and adoption, et cetera. Any organization that provides open infrastructure for research um, communications and adopts the principles are absolutely welcome. As you can see here over the years, um, there have been organizations that have come up and formally publicly shared their um, commitment to it, their intent to these um, principles, however they may fall, um, as I'll walk through them. We'll, we'll get a bigger, a better sense of what that looks like. But we're so pleased that um, these organizations um, have have joined this this um, this growing community. And at the end, I'll talk a little bit more about how um, any of you who are involved in scholarly infrastructure organizations might also well do so too. So, why are principles of this kind needed? Um, just a little bit of background, roll through this quickly. I think many of you have been thinking about these issues, um, but we just wanted to talk a little bit about why in the context. So the new economy of research is distributed with the internet across platforms. It's global. Thank you. Um, thanks, thanks to those of you who are here all around the world with more collaborations than ever, increasingly interdisciplinary and it involves sharing more research objects and formats, such as data, software, conference papers, preprints, books, articles, reviews, discussions, video, audio, all the more than ever. And these are discrete, you can call them occasions, events, artifacts, they need to be linked together and in a way that makes clear the scholarly record, who, what are involved for the research enterprise to run. Um, this is absolutely instrumental um, for those who support research, such as the administrators of research institutions, funding systems, SCALCOMs and research discovery platforms, tools, et cetera. So foundational infrastructure underlies all of this and is instrumental to the in entire enterprise. Where we store, ha having a place to store these having the ability to be able to identify them uniquely, um, being able to describe what each of those are and the relationships um, between these, linking all of this together. That's what, um, that's how I think about foundational infrastructure or infrastructure. If the production of knowledge be oriented though around towards the common good, then the organizations involved in facilitating this need to align their interests with the common good. Above all, they need to be trusted. By its very nature, infrastructure especially falls into this camp. The reality today is that there is no shortage of signs that trust is eroding, or in some cases one might argue indelibly lost already in scholarly communications. If we don't trust the process of generating, validating, and disseminating knowledge, how can we set up knowledge production and exchange in a way that works towards the common good? So today, looking all around the world, can we say that research is unequivocally working towards that? Trust, then, is what I'm going to really focus on um, as the end uh, concept. As, but. The problem with trust is that it can't be measured. It's too hard to describe. It's subjectively recognized and experienced. It's in, assess, in essence is different for each. Many people use the metaphor of the blind man who are all feeling out different parts of the elephant. Um, so, however, we, myself, Cameron, as well as Jeffrey, we're thinking if that is, the place we are at with this very fuzzy notion of trust, how about we consider trustworthiness, which can be externalized, thus characterized. Trustworthiness has, we have thought through, there may be more, three dimensions right now in our framework. It's a stool built on three legs, governance, sustainability, and insurance. Governance ensures that the service takes the needs of those who are in the, in the community and the others into account rather than be owned by one central player with all the power. Sustainability ensures that the service will be more likely around tomorrow, next year, five years from now. Insurance is an out clause 
which keeps us all honest. If trustworthiness can be externalized, it can be characterized based on particular qualities it has, which expresses it. Um, we think of these as signals that an infrastructure provider is trustworthy. I'm going to go through each of these fairly quickly, um, but we can always come back and kind of double click on any of them. Governance, how do we define or think of governance? It's the, I guess, the pro a more formal definition is the establishment of policies, continuous monitoring of their proper implementation by the members of the governing body. Um, it ensures that effectively, though, that the service, you know, um, addresses and re responds to the needs of, of all. And our interest in this area is also that if an infrastructure, that if infrastructure is successful and becomes critical to the community, we need to ensure that it is not co-opted by, say, one particular interest group <clears throat> or a set of them. Similarly, we need to ensure that an organization doesn't confuse serving itself with serving its stakeholders. How do we ensure that the system is run humbly that recognizes it doesn't have a right to exist entitlement beyond the support it provides for the community? Sustainability or the ability or the process of maintaining change in a balanced fashion in an evolving world such that it um, continues to be supported, upheld, or confirmed. I think we think that financial sustainability is a key element, sometimes not something that many of us are used to thinking about or comfortable with thinking about. Um, but at the end of the day, trust does rely on it. Um, that said, it's certainly not all of it. Um, trust often elides multiple elements, intentions, resources, and checks and balances. So an organization that is both well-meaning and has the right expertise will still not be trusted if it doesn't have sustainable resources to execute its mission. How can we ensure that this organization has the resources to meet its obligations to its users, its community, the world for the common good? Insurance, we can define as a thing providing protection against a possible eventuality. Even with the best possible governance structures, critical infrastructure can still be co-opted by a subset of stakeholders or simply drift away from the needs of the community. Long-term trustworthiness requires the community to believe that it retains control. So there are a set of principles that we think which can be externally displayed as signals that fall under this. The open source community we borrowed from serves an instructive reference model to ensure that the community can take control if necessary. The, in the infrastructure must be what we call forkable, that the community can replicate the entire system if the organization loses support of the stakeholders, despite all of the checks and balances that have been put into place. And obviously this is not to say that forking doesn't come with it a high cost. And in practice, it will always remain challenging. But the option, excuse me, the option to recreate the infrastructure coupled with the affordances to do so will create more confidence in the system. And this possibility prompts all the players we believe to work better together, spurring a more virtuous cycle. Acts that reduce the feasibility of forking, then are strong signals that um, say concerns should be raised by the community if that happens. So from the set of signals of trustworthiness, we used all of them to model out a type of infrastructure provider that the research enterprise needs and deserves. So in this context, these signals have become principles and we hope um, uh, will serve as a blueprint, as a framework for organizations that already exist and strive to ground the trust that the community has placed in them, or for new collaborations or enterprises just getting off the ground. Signals to a blueprint, to a framework. So as I have gone over, there are three high-level areas, 16 commitments, and there is a posy posse um, that have come forward um, with the intention of committing um, and practice and are practicing um, these commitments to date. And so the organizations have published that this um, in, in the community um, so that 
the, the community um, can conduct appraisals um, in a formal fashion or informal fashion, however they may choose. But this is one example of how one of the organizations, Crossref, um, as Katrina mentioned, my, my previous House of Residents have chosen um, to share this with, with the community. And there, um, as you can see, that um, Crossref has conducted this uh, audit um, in 2020, again in 2021, because things change, things evolve with every organization. Just because um, an organization has been able to show with evidence that they have non-discriminatory membership say in one year does not mean that um, it is one and done and that um, that that is guaranteed in the future. So this framework has been set up um, for organizations who attest to this to be able to review this over time and for the community to see updates um, as, as those over time as well. So um, I'm a product director, I build products, um, and in the product management world, there is this very common basic notion of a customer journey or a user journey. So modeled out of that, I was thinking um, of just talking through in very practical terms, what does an organization who chooses, who wishes um, to also adopt these principles and commit to these principles look like with this framework? Um, hence an organizational journey. And this is just one, a reference model, a straw person, if you will, um, just to get you thinking through um, what that might look like and by no means um, definitive. So um, there are obviously many forms and representations of this put into practice. And um, one of the great uh, useful things about having this framework out in the world is that it starts conversations internally um, about governance, sustainability, insurance. It can unearth through these conversations concrete places where the organization says, it's an aff affirmative moment. We do this well, right? Or maybe it unearths places of opportunity where change can happen. Some of these changes can be made more quickly than others. But at some point, the, an organization providing infrastructure can choose to share where they fit within this rubric and as part of its commitment more publicly to adopting these principles, identifying areas where they will make investments to move the needle in certain sections, like a statement of intent, as many of these organizations have done. And to be clear, there are no organizations that say have identified themselves um, as score as 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 doing all of these to the best of all possible ways, and the framework was originally set up knowing that these many of these are going to be aspirational. But upon sharing these with the community, we see organizations as continuing to activate these principles, not only by doing them, but also integrating it into their community engagement practices. How do you select collaborators and um, strategic partners? Do you want them to trust do, um, in, in doing this work, to deliver in a way that reflect the community and its needs? I'm pretty sure that some of the questions you're asking are most likely already embedded and codified in here. So this, um, think about these as an extension of many of the things, items um, that are already important to you, that are already top of mind. As I mentioned, orgs, they're not static entities. So we encourage organizations to revisit the framework on a regular cadence as you have adopted them. It's always possible for, for one to say regress on a particular commitment or in fact advance in it. This is obviously an image that many of y'all are familiar with, CAPTCHA. I am not a bot. Um, in this case, um, the joke is here, I am not untrustworthy. This is only to bring it back to say that it's it's not about trust, which is the most important kind of concept, um, albeit highly subjective, but moving it to practical, um, externalizable um, and measurable ways in which we can talk about this as we think about how do we set up organizations to work for the common good. Um, we would love to get feedback 
um, as we move through, um, as, as you think through this, these are original principles. They were never meant to be definitive. It was meant to spur on conversations, discussions within the community, especially those amongst you who are um, um, committing to them. Um, we have gotten very good uh, um, feedback from, uh, say, Chris Holdraff um, about addressing environmental sustainability in the principles. We've also gotten good feedback, for example, from K Caitlin Thaney about diving in more on financial transparency and equity and governance, um, conflicts um, that are not disclosed. So I think we believe the principles um, could, could can continue to be updated. Um, give us your feedback. Um, we would love to hear from that. With that, I think I will I will just wrap and pass it to um, Jean-Claude to give us more theoretical grounding in our discussions further. Thanks so much, um, uh, Jennifer. That, that was uh, great and a real practical way for organizations uh, to actually look at their own processes um, um, in, in a very structured um, uh, way that is actually very aligned with open science. Okay, let's move on. We'll come back to the questions. Uh, Jean-Claude, over to you. You've got uh, uh, 15 minutes or so um, to present uh, your thoughts on, on the common good um, uh, and publishing and communication. Thank you very much for inviting me for this really very good conference. And oh, Jean-Claude, I, I don't know if it's just me, but I'm having problems hearing you. Um, can you turn, I can, we can hear you, but you're very faint. Um, you may need to get nearer the mic. Yeah. I'm having technical. Oh, much better. better. Much better. better. Right. Okay, I'll, I'll move closer to the microphone. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much for this um, uh, privilege to participate in what has turned out to be a much better conference than I expected, actually. So it's a reward to be here. And uh, allow me to uh, barge into what I think I have to say in this conference. I'd like you to project yourself back around 1470, and you are a member of a scriptorium somewhere in Europe, and you have these new guys coming along and you know, touting this new technology with which they're going to revolutionize the copying of documents. It's uh, apparently called the printing press. And all you want to do at that point, I mean, you are the dominant structure, you're all over the place, you have been there around for a long time. You know how to produce your expensive parchment and the rest of it. And uh, you really wonder how you might want to tweak your system to sort of, well, essentially deflect and fend off these uh, people who are erupting into your landscape and actually disturbing you. And in a sense, uh, I have had the feeling in the last couple of days that I've heard a lot of that a lot of scriptoria uh, people uh, coming here to defend the scriptorium in front of something which should be entirely different and much more, uh, let's say, adapted or fitting the digital context within which we are moving now. So let me try and organize this presentation quickly by asking first, well, what is a journal? Because after all, the journal is a, a spin-off from the, the print world. It was a way to mechanize mail exchange, actually. And uh, how, what have we got with the journal now? And another thing that I've heard a lot in the last couple of days is that it sounds like, or it looks like, as if most of the time, the journal is an eternal entity that everybody agrees upon. Everybody knows that it's there and we're going to live with it forever. Um, I'd like to remind the whole audience that the journal completely changed in nature and in uh, intent and in uh, impact and in ways of even existing, you might say, uh, in the last 75 years. 
The journal before the Second World War was a voice, an instrument for a community, generally a society or an, ac an academy, or perhaps a university to uh, express voices that were related to that journal. There's a community-based sort of exercise, and the journal was a way to amplify that voice. You might see a journal as a loudspeaker in some sense. After the Second World War, a number of things happened which changed uh, the existing landscape. I don't have the time here to build the whole argument, but to make it very, very quick, uh, after the Second World War, with in enormous increases in demands for publishing after the war, um, the commercial publishers found a way to move in at last, because they had tried to do that for a long time and had found marginal uh, secondary markets, but not the main one by and large. And the way they did that were, required not only a much more increased um, demand, but also a number of other things. And the other things that happened had to do with uh, creating a market. How do you create a market of esoteric publications read right by, right by 300 or 400 or 500 people at most? That was the challenge, that was the problem. Well, Mr. Garfield gave the publishers the way to do it. Mr. Garfield invented the signed citation index as everybody agrees, but he also did something more insidious and much more important in, 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 in a real sense. He essentially told uh, everybody that Bradford's law was quite interesting. For those of you who remember what Bradford's Law is, it was a way to tell librarians that if you want to respond to the needs of your community, not any community, your community, well, you know what are the main journals these people really want to, and then you can quickly uh, move to a few more titles, and with that you'll cover the proverbial 80% or 85% of the needs of that community. And that's good enough. And that's the way it should be. And you create that way a collection that fits the local needs of your institution. Well, Garfield changed that by creating a little fable of a meeting of librarians, which led essentially to the result that everybody discovered they all wanted the same journal. Now that's an interesting first thing. But the second consequence of that is that all the librarians want to buy the journals, which are at the core, at the center of this thing, as if everybody agreed that the same journals are valid for everybody. Now, to do that, you had to somehow evaluate these journals, and that's where the impact factor came in. And the impact factor came as a way to rank the journals. And by ranking the journals, every library could see how far down the line they could go with their own money and the competition to be up the scale of that ranking system was of course the way to obtain better market shares now the whole point the whole point of all this was to align the market onto the intellectual communication and publishing system and from that point on the modern system of scientific publishing began to to evolve i mean there are many many details to be added to this story, but I think you understand quite easily that the, the, uh, whole, the whole point is for the commercial publisher to align the intellectual forum of ideas, which is what science and knowledge is all about, and uh, the uh, creation of a market. And assessment, I heard a lot of statements about assessment in the previous uh, sessions, assessment was really designed to create the notion that there is a quality, um, a quality vision for the whole world, the same one for the whole world, and that, that from that point you could create an orderly ranking of journals, an orderly market of journals, and thereby a, an orderly commerce of journals. Then the game was well established. It's like deciding to obey the rules of football to play in a league in a league in some part of the world. In this case, the league was worldwide. And it was defined by two, essentially, eventually by two private companies, Caravate and uh, Elsevier Scopus, 
to uh, to organize this market. Now, this is this is, I think, the very very fundamental situation in which we are and which we cannot escape. And that's the reason why I think a lot of the comments I heard around this conference were more like defending what a publisher should be doing, what, uh, how do you make it sustainable for to use that word and so on and so forth. But the real issue was constantly essentially ignored. Uh, the issue was, uh, do we need a worldwide system of journals ranked universally with one criterion so as to organize a world market in one language furthermore, so that everything works in the same step. And then of course, uh, the merchants of journals are very satisfied. But we also know that this situation is creating an, an awful lot of, of, of malaise in the world. And therefore, uh, that's what we have to, to address. The problem that we have to really uh, put forth is how can we restore the importance of knowledge first and that of commerce at best second. Knowledge is first. If there is a system of commerce to support knowledge, that may be all right, but the system of knowledge should not be a pretext to support the system of commerce. We, don't, we are not here to support a, a bunch of merchants. We're here to support a large group of people who are creating perhaps the most valuable element of humanity, namely its capacity to evolve knowledge. And I think we should really keep that objective, that function, that goal very straight in front of us. If we don't do that, then we start doing all kinds of mitigations, compromises, and, and, and ambiguities, which end up leading to all sorts of, I would say, perversions in the whole system. And anyone who is having fun watching the list, for example, retraction watch, you know, knows that this, this situation is becoming grave. It's becoming very, very bad. So as I don't have much time, let me go on now to the next step. I think things like what Jennifer just presented um, outside of the whole issue of sustainability and all that, which again is harking back to, to really preserving and tweaking what used, used to exist. I think that's an extremely good way of doing things, but let me extend, extend and expand that very briefly. Research emerges in very precise sites, universities, research labs, whatever. These sites are the best place to not have publishers but certainly to house some publishing functions to distinguish between the two. These sites are where the communications between scientists are most intense. And that's where also you can identify locally what is coming at the best stuff that's coming out of that particular site. So registration and preservation should be immediately uh, done locally by the libraries linked to these institutions. Then you have the question of the certification and evaluation eventually, and of course, dissemination. At that point, I think the best thing to do is not to work through a system which intensifies competition between universities and research labs with a result that they don't speak to each other or they do very weird things with each other, but rather have them learn how to network positively and create the way to, uh, to have a, a sort of one stop but distributed system of access to all that knowledge that's being produced and through a system of open peer review have a system of evaluation that is completely transparent and has nothing to do with creating in any way uh, some elements of the prestige or the value, economic value and so on of the journal. And you have the, the, um, the, the result of having then something that begins to look very much what I think is being done by the core C-O-A-R, the core project Notify. You're starting to have the ways to also push out 
from local centers and think of the old journals of the societies, the loudspeakers, the voices coming out of communities, trying to be heard by other communities. You can push out this through, um, it, of course, digital and networked solutions, the, the importance of what you're doing locally, but at the same time, you're exposing it to criticism and to evaluation and to reform and to emendation and to correction and to refutation by other groups. In other words, you unify the communication and the publication system while having it working through a well-ordered system of following up the question of the, the issuing of um, versions of knowledge that are being produced here and there. And in the end, you, have, you could have an orderly system coming out of that. You're going to say, who is going to pay for all this? Well, this is the whole point. Actually, the whole system of the market was to essentially funnel all the money from the funders and the libraries towards the publishers. That money is still there. The point is to make it go in a different fashion. And I find that in a way, the subscribe to open uh, approach is amusing and good because although I think it's tied to the past, it retains the Nexus you know, uh, libraries publisher, it retains the foregrounding of journals and so on, but it, um, it actually also does something more subtle. It re it reworks uh, and reshapes completely the flow of money uh, and the direction where money goes. And if it, it, if it is becoming a, let's say a distributed yet very widespread strategy by, for example, university presses, small publishers and, um, and societies, uh, society uh, journals, uh, you may end up having there the means to uh, really reshape the scientific system. I will end with just one final remark. The, the whole issue of assessment with whatever, whatever technique you do uh, is essentially flawed for two reasons. The first reason is if it's quantitative, it really opens the door to rankings and competition. And we've got too much of that and rankings are not useful. And the universality of rankings is an illusion. The second thing, is that the, the quality, there is no quality which is worldwide. When you do some research someplace in the world, uh, it may be extremely good for that part of the world, but it is not that important elsewhere. When people were publishing things on cholera and nature, no one read it. And uh, the reason is because nature was going to libraries in countries where cholera is of no importance anymore. So you have, you have these kinds of disconnect between uh, the needs and the evaluation that local communities may need of, of research and the, uh, the quality and the, the uh, concept of quality attached to that research. What I would say is that let quality be what people want it to be locally and uh, what they need for the, the thing uh, that they want to do with research. The point is that you must maintain a system which can allow the refutation, emendation, correction, and all that of research to go on, but you don't have to manage it through a universal system of quality, which is an illusion. I'll stop there because I could go on, as you can well imagine, for quite a long time on these kinds of themes, but uh, I'll stop there and I'll just, just end up by saying, yes, trust is extremely important, we also must clearly, extremely clearly distinguish between the production of knowledge and belief. So thank you very much. Thank you. That was, that was tremendous, uh, Jean-Claude, um, um, and full of so many thoughts and provocations um, that uh, uh, we can follow uh, very many different threads. Uh, Jennifer, thanks for, for joining. I'm going to um, start by uh, trying to tease some of these things um, apart. Um, 
and, and fundamental uh, to, to the problem uh, that you were talking about is uh, uh, that of journals themselves uh, not being uh, appropriate or fit for a sort of digital age of communication. And where do you think that this link between, uh, 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 I mean, wasn't scholarly publishing and publishers set up for the communication of scholarly knowledge? Um, those functions uh, you're suggesting have basically, or those links between publishing and communication have actually been lost uh, somehow in the past hundred years. Uh, uh, um, since since the, the the printing press, and especially so, given the the global and digital network we're in, can you um, talk more about that um, uh, that link between communication and publishing? Um, less so much in in terms of of what we've lost, but how uh, publishing can now start to support the functions of communication what are those uh, functions how can and i'm i want to i want to make a distinction because you did did you have made a distinction between publishers and publisher functions and i think we've also uh, uh, there's a disconnect uh, there um, i'm, I'm going to stop there and Jen, jennifer i'd love uh, your thoughts on this um, 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 as well um, but let's start, uh, um, Jean-Claude. So the, the links between communication and publishing and how we can restore those functions to publishing. Right, I'll, I'll be fast because for the, the, the sake of time again, but let me take an example. In the digital world, platforms become extremely important and some platforms have become, have been, I think, very inventive um, even though they ended up into the hands of commercial entities in the end. I'm thinking, for example, in particular, I'm thinking about F1000 Research, which uh, Vitek Trax, uh, with his usual brilliance, uh, invented. I mean, he's a very brilliant guy. Um, the, um, what I like about the F1000 Research is not the commercial side of it. No, what I like about about it is the way it does exactly what Bianca Kramer and Jerome Bozeman in Holland have been saying for quite a while. They've said, let's get away from the version of record, but let's keep a record of versions. And that's what the conversation or communication system is about. The scientists or the scholars argue with each other, debate with each other, um, correct each other and so on. And once in a while, they, they come to some sort of relative and temporary consensus about something and then they, it should be published. It should be, okay, at this stage, we agree on this thing. We know it's going to be again debated later on, but at least for the moment, let's have a, let's have a sort of stable uh, base on which we, from which we can push further. You know, we have Newton now, let's work with Newtonian stuff. Oh, Einstein, come on, leave us alone. You're disturbing the boat, you're, you're, you know, and so on. But then Einstein comes along and he replaces uh, uh, Newton. That's the way science works. It's by having plat uh, stable platforms in the different sense from the <laughs> digital platform. Uh, stable platforms are the which people can, can argue and work together, but we have to keep track of how the uh, people move on that. Think of uh, computer programming. Computer programs are well known with versions you have Windows 11 or whatever it is nowadays. I don't use Windows, but uh, it's but the the uh, people know that they have this version of the program and they work on that. We've got to create versions of knowledge, and our, our governance system is a is a system that should aim at creating an orderly system of versions of knowledge which at the same time, by the way, would remind people that knowledge is our best effort, but unlike some forms of belief, is not absolute. It's, uh, it's as good as we can get, and we have to work with that. But uh, we know that in a, in, in a generation or two, it's going to be different again. And that's what we've got to sort of work together. So 
we have platforms now in the digital sense of platforms on which journals sit. These journals could sit on these platforms while perhaps moving back. And I think the Latin American example that Dominique Babini was talking about in the previous uh, session is very telling in this regard. If these journals could move back as loudspeakers for various communities of research, of instruments, of, of problems, of concerns, and so on, this would be much better. This would be much better. So we could, we can't really get rid of journals nowadays. They're too, in the geopolitics, so to speak, of the uh, world economy of knowledge, journals, because of the commercial publishers, have come to occupy a huge role in evaluation assessment of everything. So as we cannot move them out of the, of the landscape directly and go to the real task of creating knowledge, let's try nudge the nature of journals. Let's play some judo with journals in some way, use their strength as uh, visible way, uh, objects that people look at in order to move them back to uh, expressing what communities need to uh, express to respond to their needs, to their uh, possibilities, to, their, uh, to, to everything they want to do in their research. And let's thereby, in passing, decolonize a lot of world research, because instead of having problems simply defined by the narrow group of, of leading labs in the, in, the, in the global north, we could have now a much wider base of, um, of questions, of hypotheses coming out of the whole planet, leading yeah. to a broadened base for knowledge, which should bring us to a higher pyramid in the end, if the base yeah. is better. And, uh, and at the same time, resolve some of the problems of, uh, you know, forms of knowledge and forms of questioning, which are not so familiar to some parts of the world, but are more familiar elsewhere. Yes, the... uh, th th uh, that's great. And I, I would very much like to come back to that issue of the role of the global north um, in this system uh, as well in the creation. Um, I think also your acknowledgement there that journals are probably not going to go away as such. <laughs> But no, they might be, uh, and and how, and this speaks to some of the discussion that Amy Brand was brought up yesterday about we know the sort of world we went, we want. You know, if knowledge is a common good. It's like no other commodity. How, and how can um, can publishing and, and and scholarly communication function to promote that knowledge? Um, then uh, what we do in the transition might not be ideal. But how you know we need steps to get there, um, and I want to come back to competition as well, Jennifer. I just want to ask in terms of, of your view, um, and perhaps especially as a as a as a product uh, manager, both as a product manager and someone who is trying to engender trust trust as a sort of integral part of the system of scholarly communication. Um, how do you where do you see uh, journals and the role of publishing versus the role of publishers per se? Very good question. And like Jean-Claude, we could go on about this um, for many, many a beer or not. But I think, you know, to, to start off with, I agree that link between communication, scholarly communications and publishing um, is growing farther and farther. Um, and this is due in part to a number of factors, um, uh, principally what um, the digital world can offer. As we see more experiments in how scholarly communication works, um, those experiments um, have sometimes grown and perhaps faster than say traditional publishers have been able to keep up um, in response to the way that the world at large has um, you know changed um, with the speed of of a, a dissemination of information exchange. But I think all of this points to the need, for publishers to support, for the support of scholarly communications, no less. And, and I would claim there's even more of a role 
of those parties who call themselves publishers or parties who call themselves whatever in, in this world. Because at the end of the day, um, if you are a so-called publisher and your mission is to provide the conditions for the production of knowledge and exchange, there is absolutely that need um, as we move into this unknown, you know, vast, brave new world. Um, and as you mentioned, some, you know, it's about the functions the publisher um, takes on, not so much the name. Some of the functions that um, Jean-Claude and, and Katrina have mentioned are um, preservation, dissemination, certification, evaluation. In my opinion, some are needed in this new world. Um, in my humble opinion, some not by the publisher. But um, coordination, and if you want to take data, those of y'all who work on data um, as an example, interoperability, right? You can have all the data in the world. If it's not interoperable, it's very hard to use. It's very hard to derive any insight to get um, answers to any questions. So this notion of interoperability, I think, is a really, really big one in this um, in this current context. Joining up all of the disparate threads, the places, the events where research is being shared and discussed. Um, that's a, it's a vast web, right? Standardization. Um, pardon me if these are terms that are too you know technologically oriented, but I th I, I think that they they provide some instructive ways to conceptualize. Um, the very important roles that um, those who call themselves publishers still continue. Um, and I'll just close to say that what this opens up is then if we take evaluation um, in the in the formal sense, in the traditional sense off the table, it allows for different definitions of quality to reference back to what Jean-Claude was speaking of. Um, these definitions, which will better fit the needs of the community, because the common good is a very monolithic term, which we understand and can point to and is and is and very important for this conversation. But what that actually looks like is going to be very different depending on who's involved. I'll stop there. Um, yes, uh, um, those are great points. And, and, uh, and I think um, that, that point both about um, um, interoperability. I mean, if a functions of publishers and publishing is to enable communication, then we we are in a position, if you are, publishers, whatever they are, whatever you are in a position to enable those connections between people, research, funders, institutions, uh, different regional uh, disciplines, different languages, all of those things are things that could be encompassed under publishing and are being um, overlooked by the focus on the past publishing uh, uh, and, and the fact that it has been uh, commercialized. And I think that the commercialization of knowledge um, is, is a problem. I think that they're not necessarily completely incompatible. Um, someone, it was Alien Fife, who said to me last week that even, you know, in your scriptorium example, John Claude is, is fantastic. But even right at the start, uh, um, scholarly um, academies, scholarly societies uh, contracted their work out to uh, printing presses, commercial printing presses, uh, to get the very first uh, um, uh, journals. They worked with it. I think there is an issue around research and digital research, um, uh, particularly around things like text and data mining, that sort of interoperability, where there have been the most wonderful um, um, productive partnerships in, re in research communities, public and private partnerships, where you think about the COVID pandemic. I don't think that uh, uh, my own view that being uh, a commercial company can prevent you from engaging in partnerships, collaboration, the creation of trust, new scholarly communication systems. But I, I would like to talk about this because I know, I know it has such a role, um, um, commercialization within the publishing industry. And, and, and can, we, can we actually separate those two and, and create real synergy and benefits where appropriate. Um, 
And in this respect, I want to also uh, uh, just ask you questions uh, about the role of uh, not-for-profit publishers in this space and um, scholarly um, societies. They are um, part of the system. They're part of the uh, prestige economy around brands, around journals. There are uh, large uh, uh, not-for-profit societies that act uh, in a very commercial business way like way uh, as do commercial companies. There are also good small commercial companies that act uh, in a very different way, in a very progressive way. Um, and um, I think part of this uh, also speaks to your, your uh, discussion around competition, uh, competition for resources and sustainability and sustainability of societies themselves, uh, competition between publishers. And ultimately it goes now back to competition and hyper competition between researchers that all feed in um, to the system. Um, so, can you start to potentially uh, disentangle that so that we don't necessarily have a binary system of, of what is good or bad? Is there room for, is there a role for commercial players and, uh, or even societies acting in their own commercial interests? Uh, around uh, around publishing that could also benefit the common good, promote knowledge dissemination, um, and uh, um, uh, be in line with the principles uh, that Jennifer talked about. Do you want me to answer? Uh, I want you both to answer it, but we'll start with you, yes. Oh, okay, sorry, Jennifer, thank you. Um, I don't think the issue is, to, is, is the binary commercial versus, the, the issue is that what happens when the commercial gets mixed up with some function? Boeing makes planes. They generally make very good planes and they are a very good commercial company. But once in a while, there are very funny things happening. Like they try to get a new system to compete against another company called Airbus and they, they put new software in the plane and lo and behold, two planes crash. And we have a long, long story after that about the about that particular brand of plane from Boeing. It's I think it's exemplary that once you start mixing the values and the objectives within one single product, you are going to have a tension between those objectives. Publishers will publish good journals while looking for as much profit as they can, at least for some of them. Some, I agree, are not that intent on making money and they just want to be to continue doing their, their professional work. But let's take the, the big commercial ones, especially the ones that are publicly traded, which by, by essence have to respond to the needs of their investors. Um, such companies can produce extremely good journals, but the tension is going to be there. There is going to be, and I think one point to examine where one should really examine that and do far deeper studies of what's going on is the relationship between the management of the financial side of a journal with the editors of the journal. We see tension arising over and over and over again. We see rebellions. We see people trying to found new journals. We find uh, publishers trying to control the name of the journals so as to ensure that if there is a rebellion, they maintain the brand. Uh, you know, you, you get these kinds of, of, of things. So the problem is not so much a binary thinking. The two are in place and will be in place for a long time. History doesn't move that fast. But conceptually, one has to say to oneself, uh, what is the cost of having this conflation or mingling or convergence of um, objectives which are not always compatible between each other? And then once you've asked this question, you might say, is there a way of thinking it otherwise? And I think there is, I think Jennifer is on to, to it herself very, very strongly. There is a whole area of um, economic activity in passing, by the way, everything that needs money is not necessarily market economy. We know that, but in particular, one area that is in this uh, working in this fashion is the area of infrastructures. And Jennifer has mentioned the name. I think knowledge is an infrastructure of humanity. 
It's a very important infrastructure of humanity. And infrastructure needs money, like roads. But imagine if we allow this, this has happened in fact in the past in the 19th century. Imagine if we had private companies building competing roads, the mess that would create into the landscape. Uh, the, this is what we are, we are dealing with. We are trying to deal with a, an infrastructure and people are trying to treat it as if it were a merchandise. It, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Now, allowing parts of the infrastructure to be managed through market mechanisms, that I fully agree. I mean, when you, let's say you print, well, you, may, you have different kind of machines that print. You might have a market of, of, of machines to print. Uh, labs uh, use a lot of equipment. A lot of that equipment is also part of a market. That doesn't mean the knowledge, the knowledge system has to be driven by a market uh, and on and on. You can certainly find sectors inside the knowledge production and preservation and evolution system uh, to, to let bits of market work if you're so intent on keeping the market going. But the point is that the basic infrastructure of knowledge, which is so crucial to humanity, think of climate change right now in the battles about that, this is, this is uh, I mean, it's our own survival we're talking about now. Um, think about, about that sort of importance one has to give to knowledge and then put the market in comparison and you say, okay, well, you can find your place without bothering the system, fine, but don't bother the system. And I think that's the opportunity for yeah, commercial publishers because there is an opportunity there and it's not being taken up. Uh, Jennifer. Um, Thank you. Um, the just to go back to Posey, the uh, Posey was set up um, in to offer clear ways to the community to compare organizational governance, sustainability, and insurance practices, and that, that was intentionally in a set up in a way irrespective of the organization's tax status, um, because at the end of the day, it is what you do. Um, that shows how you play. Um, but right now we're not doing, there's not a lot of transparency on how you play, right? Um, so we're hoping that Posey can provide that view. And then it's really not so much about the legal entity or even if you have a formal governance structure or documents attesting to your organization as an entity at all. Um, I guess I'll also say that the wide adoption of these principles can, in fact, help commercial organizations. Those, and and and, and this is also to say that that I encourage commercial organizations to think about POSI um, because it sets some clear ground rules about how they can invest in creating services for the community um, in a way that respects their interests and gains their trust. Um, it also minimizes the financial risk of investing heavily in something that the community ultimately doesn't need, rejects, due to concerns about enclosure, privacy, fee hikes, um, and other adverse effects that are uh, associated with a service. Um, I'll also say that being a nonprofit does not make adherence to POSI automatic. Um, and so I think this is this framework can be useful regardless. Um, I think that I think that's a really interesting interesting point because I think all organisations can benefit from looking at Posey, and I'm really actually welcome the fact that you think commercial organisations can sign sign up to them. Um, the um, one and and I, I I totally agree, and I think what we all share here is the sense that the commercial, uh, commercialization of knowledge is not an ideal. The, um, the, uh, and I think that the, Completely. however, as Jean-Claude also mentioned, the commercialization that we have seen to provide the conditions for the production of knowledge, um, that there, there, there may be a space for that, um, a market of machines That's to right. print. Right. As, as service providers to, yeah. that, to that knowledge 
that, that knowledge generation. I'm aware we've just uh, raced through this time, apologies, and we have um, some questions to the audience. And I'm going to start with Jeffrey Bolton's uh, question, um, 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 which it comes straight, straight to the point. Why is the scholastic community ineffectual in acting on the blindingly obvious profound deficits of the current system? They themselves, and he includes himself in this, could solve the problem overnight. Why isn't this happening? Do we just wait or do we act? Can I answer that? Please. Since I'm an academic. <laughs> well, it goes back to assessment and the, the way it has been built up. The whole point is that people take assessment as a tool, as a way to examine quality, whatever it is, and so on and so forth. It is an instrument to discipline to discipline. I'm using Michel Foucault's uh, approach there in analyzing the situation to discipline the, the, the set of all the universities and research centers in the world by ranking everybody, ranking their labs, ranking the institutions, and eventually ranking the whole countries. You're putting people into, under a yoke, a yoke which is extraordinarily powerful and which is, as we all know, is completely directed by Caravate and uh, Elsevier Scopus. And uh, <clears throat> this makes absolutely no sense. But the poor guy who goes into the university and, and is, uh, is not foolhardy as I've been in my own life, which made me a lot freer. But if he is not, he's trying to lead a normal career or she is doing a normal career in the university, there is at all steps of the way, the reminder that you've got to toe the line because the rankings are going to be appearing for your hiring, your promotion, your prizes and your grants. And if you don't know the, if you don't do well on those four stages, you're out, you're simply out, publish or perish, okay? And that's the, that's the whole thing. This was the genius the genius of the reform of the publishing system after World War II. Everybody was put into a disciplined, highly disciplined system. Jennifer, do you want to add anything to that? Um, yes, I guess I will say that um, we are all interconnected here, all of us, no matter which role we play. And um, because of that interdependency, there is no one act that's going to address all of the ills, right? There is no even common vision of what that common good is. So the uh, I, I, I perhaps would spin this in the opposite direction. How do we act together, right? What role can we play? Um, I've been in many conversations of finger pointing um, over the past decades, and so this this has struck me as a as a different approach, um, one that might be um, that I've seen to be more useful and um, and and have you know in this orientation. Then you know it's about how can we address this specific problem by working together with you know say a group that um, is you researcher user facing can to move the needle on the community advocacy right bit. And then I partner with a tech provider because it's not just cultural change, but cultural change needs to be supported by the ability to be able to perform those actions um, through technology, through tools. And it's then, you know, we then partner with a group that's interested in, in um, addressing the incentives part, right? Where, where this whole system and we as individuals and organizations um, operate under certain incentives. Funders then might be uh, an example of a partner. Um, to, but if we collaborate and work together across a broader swath of the many dimensions, which are active, always active in every you know activity process that we see, I think we'll, we'll um, likely be able to make change more quickly. Okay, there's another question that a few people have brought this in about the roles of, of library or institution based publishers. Um, do you see that as as more of the same uh, potentially or a good thing, or uh, could they be subject to exactly the same problems um, that you've been uh, uh, that, that have been discussed here. Um, do you want me to. Yeah, please. Um, 
I like the concept of Lorcan Dempsey, the inside out library, which is that because it's inside a research institution, it can very efficiently uh, start playing some of the basic publishing functions. We go back to the functions there. And uh, it can retrieve the local production. It can guarantee that it has been done by bona fide people and, and by a, a worthwhile institution, the notion of trust that uh, Jennifer was mentioning. And it's the beginning of the creation of what the core system of Notify can build on. And then you have open review and all that. And those. So yes, indeed, it is very important. The second thing is that libraries do have a budget to acquire, acquire documents. So they have a budget money to support a publishing and communication system. Now, the traditional role that they've played has been to buy, buy subscriptions and buy books. But that money can now perhaps be diverted and being used to, uh, to support other things. And I've long argued that libraries should start joining together and say every year we're going to decrease the amount of money we spend on buying subscriptions and books. And we are going to use that money to start building together um, a, a network infrastructure of the inside out network uh, system, which I think their policy could be so useful to, to help move forward in terms of values, in terms of objectives, in terms of uh, a sort of orderly uh, evolution. Jennifer, do you, do you want to come in on that? Uh, um, no, I think Jean-Claude. Um, so I have a, thank you. I have a direct question for you. So, so this is from anonymous attendee. What are your thoughts on the lobbying role of infrastructure organizations? In terms That's a very good question. I didn't spend enough time talking through each one of the different principles, um, but this is something we explicitly called out um, under the governance set of principles that an infrastructure organization, foundational infrastructure organization, we do not conceive of them actually lobbying. Um, this is not to say that there is not an, a very important role in, in lobbying for whatever advocacy um, orientation or stance, um, but that the, inf the role of the infrastructure organization is not to lobby. I uh, think the, the reason for this being um, is that the community should collectively drive regulatory change. And um, the role for infrastructure is to provide that base for others to work on. Um, and when um, an infrastructure organization, if an infrastructure, infrastructure organization gets into the, you know, the wheelings and dealings of the legislative environment, that it puts it in a position where it is less likely um, to be able to continue to serve the interests of the community at large. Yeah, and actually that, that sort of uh, leads on to, to um, another point, which is about uh, um, regulation uh, uh, and infrastructure organization. This comes from Marzia Brill, but also uh, Catherine Skinner ha have done it, and perhaps you'd like to, to talk to this first, uh, Jennifer. So Marcia said, I've heard terms like the open access market, a commercial publishers aside, thinking about big tech and calls for regulation. Big tech are now uh, investors in knowledge communication. So you know, Google, Amazon, others. Does regulation have a role to play there? Um, and Catherine's point is that regulation can come with a, a capital R or a lowercase r, which I think is what you were just speaking to just now about the sort of community-based regulation. Um, and they're going to be talking about this in the next panel. But how can you, can you expand on how you think regulation can happen in general um, for uh, not just infrastructure organizations, but uh, publishing and scholarly and how best that can operate? Is it you know, um, yeah. The question of big tech is certainly one that is very embedded in the work that in the environment as, of, of supporting scholarly communications. Um, that is for sure. Um, we have big tech involved in a very central tool that many researchers use, such as Google Scholar. 
Right. And, and so I totally agree that they are a part of the story. Um, I don't think we have time right now to talk through whether or not the, the current global um, um, regulatory or, or state-based or um, uh, intrastate-based regulatory um, uh, movements on legislating against these big tech um, that can get into um, a whole lot of other things to think about. But um, I think the, it's a really good point that there's big R and then there's small R. And what does small R really mean? Um, in, in many ways, it can also mean that the community with enough of transparency into what organizations are doing can um, self-audit, self-appraise, right? And that, that to come back to Posey, the point of publishing um, your intent um, and your commitment to principles is to allow with evidence linking to um, the evidence for how you are explaining um, your appraisal of, of each of these principles is to allow the community to review and evaluate and hold these organizations accountable. I'll, I'll stop there. Okay, Jean-Claude, would you like to thank you? Yeah, I, I entirely agree with what Jennifer was saying. I just had one point, which is, I think is important in all of this. It's all the whole surveillance dimension of big tech with regard to the their relationship to communication and documents, um, the profiling of people, the et cetera. And we see this insidiously moving inside the universities now. I know that people at Spark are doing a lot of work on that and are monitoring that very closely. And I think they're right. They're very, very, that's very important. And that I think requires a big R regulation because uh, this surveillance uh, system uh, that is probably most visible through something like Cambridge Analytica four years ago, five years ago, uh, is something that we have to, to really be weary about uh th this is uh 1984 looks pretty pretty benign in comparison with what's shaping up i think so i mean that could be a whole other conversation about yeah about that yes. um i have a convers uh, question here from julia uh um zeta unfortunately i can't uh, read your uh surname but this is for, for Jean-Claude. Uh, from your point of view, the retaking of the central role of science over commercial interests should come from the top, i.e. from national evaluation systems or global directories or information systems. Um, or should the change uh, actually come from the bottom, from those who produce the science? And, and how, how, how can that happen? I, if I go back to my inside out library in the, the emerging system of communication publication uh, system that I could uh, easily adopt and uh, espouse, I would say it starts from the bottom, it should grow up towards the top. At some level, there might be some needs for national, national, uh, let's say, uh, regulations or policies. Um, because governments do finance research and they probably want to achieve certain goals with that. And they have a voice in, in that, but it should really start from the bottom. And, uh, and again, with the idea that people in a particular area of the world are going to want to do research in a particular way, given their stance in the world. And uh, that's, uh, that's what has to be strongly preserved. If I want to do work on cholera, I must not be evaluated by a, a, a system of evaluation, which in the end will devalue my research on cholera because it's on cholera and it's not on, the, on some sort of genomic uh, uh, nicety that is fashionable for the moment in the big labs of the North Atlantic. Um, that's, that's what I think we have to be very, very careful about. Yeah. And that speaks to Dominique's point uh, um, in the previous yeah. session uh, uh, about what is quality and there's no clear understanding or definition of it. That's uh, right. And, uh, I mean, Jennifer, how much do you think this is bottom up versus top down? I think this is an eternal debate about, and it depends on where you come from and your theory of change, right? Um, there are certainly a lot of um, very compelling points 
on both ends. Um, I think we've seen some successful change from the bottom up populist approach, um, as well as with starting with informal systems top down. Um, I think it's probably cheating, but I will cheat and say both. Yes, I think I think it's the same thing. It's about blame pointing. It that we're all responsible for change at one level. Yeah, yeah. to interact. Um, so I'm just going to I'm going to go back uh, uh, a couple of more questions. I think we can we can fit in. Hopefully, we can fit in all the, all the other questions. Um, back to journal journals. Um, but uh, um, how do you feel about uh, uh, diamond? OA journal initiatives, um, and is that the way for journal to go? So Diamond, uh, 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 where they're actually independently supported, it's uh, free to read, free to publish. What do you think? Um, who wants to go first? Well, let, let Jennifer go first. <laughs> okay, Jennifer, what do you think about OA Diamond journals? The um, so, sorry, the Diamond journal model. It, there's, I think it's it's a it's a bit. Um, new to me can you so it's basically it's basically they're supported by uh end of so you re, uh, authors aren't charged to publish uh, and readers aren't charged to subscribe they're independently funded and supported often by institutions um, uh, um academies so it basically takes off off the uh role of of, of payment at the author level uh mm -hmm. or the reader level Right. So um, as Katrina mentioned, as far as disclosure, both she and I um, worked at PLOS um, in our history, which was an APC model, right? And at that point in time, that was how that particular part of the scientific community felt like it was one way to move forward. At the end of the day, as Jean-Claude has mentioned, um, there's piping. Um, there are um, activities that must be paid for somehow. Um, and I think the sustainability part of the POSI gets at that, no matter which um, type of a legal status you are or, or type of a journal you are. Um, so how to square all of these is, is a good question. I really applaud um, the movement in certain communities that really don't have the funding model to support APCs for researchers to be able to, to, to afford APCs. Um, say in the humanities in certain social sciences. I, I don't think it's gonna be at the end of the day, one size fits all. Um, and so a lot of these um, seeing a proliferation of different ways in which we can provide the mechanisms, the conditions for, by which researchers can share their work is, is a good thing. And if I can uh, move into this discussion, I don't think the the important point is so much whether it should be specifically so-called diamond, except maybe in its generic form. What you want is a system of communication and publication that does not create uh, inequalities and inequities in these in the research communities, wherever they are. When, a, when someone has a good brain, that good brain should not be, let's say, allowed to come to its fulfillment. By, on, by virtue of its amount of money. Uh, it's, uh, it doesn't make sense. And uh, we, we need too much, all the good brains of this planet uh, to waste uh, any of them by just putting them behind paywalls and barriers and the rest of them. Now, people may say, this is not realistic. This is a utopian and all that. Well, let's dream a little bit for a moment. Now, Diamond, is one answer, and I think it's the best answer presently, to, um, to, to uh, avoid the problems of inequity, both at the reader and at the author level, because no one pays there, it's paid someone else. What I would like to say is that if we really think seriously that the communication and publication phase of research is an integral part of research, and I mean integral, part of research, then the question that arises at that point is not, how do you generate revenue? The question that comes there is, how do you allocate the research money so as to support also the communication and publication system? And when you think that in the research system, the communication publication system costs perhaps 2% of the total, 
uh, that makes no sense to uh, this to 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 pose the question. It's really because of our history that we we put uh, we do these uh, distinctions. Um, funding agencies and libraries should get together. There is a need for a big conference between funding agencies and libraries to say how do we organize our money to support research. You know, and uh, I think that that uh, if that took place together. Uh, that would create some very interesting results, some really interesting collaborations where the publishing, uh, the publishing would take a, a very different form. I like the way the European Commission uh, tried to, I say tried, to establish a publishing platform for their grantees. They ended up putting that in the hands of a commercial system, which was a little bit comical. But uh, the, 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 the point is, though, that they, they, they try to go in the right direction. Um, maybe there is there the hint of a solution. Funders might want to support, as eLife does, after all, as uh, other uh, institutions can do, uh, can support publishing, and they don't have to use APCs. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we're, we're, we're just one minute over time, unfortunately. Um, thank you so much. I think this conversation, uh, I think I think one of the main things is we need to have this conversation more and talk about it and collaborate it with all the different uh, people who, who are involved in the system. And I, I hope we can. Please, everyone, thank you so much for staying. Um, come back for the next session in 15 minutes. It's incredibly relevant to all of the conversation we've just had. Um, it's about values, values based publishing models. Um, and it will be a wonderful, a wonderful conversation. And we need to connect these, these things up. And apologies to those of you whose questions I didn't uh, get to and for running over um, uh, um, and uh, yeah, the too short notice. Um, but thank you so much, everyone, for your engagement. All right, see you soon. Bye bye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.